Hello and welcome to the shop. My name is Mike and this is Props to History. Don't forget to like and subscribe. It'll help support the channel and uh, don't forget to hit the bell for the notifications. So obviously I am surrounded by puppets. These two are of course Tom Servo and Crow from the television show Mystery Science Theater 3000, which has been running for about a thousand years. Now these two guys are just made out of junk, quite frankly, and that comes directly from the show's creator, Joel Hodgson. But puppets are used a lot in film, a lot more than people realize. And one person who has made a lot of puppets for film, including one that is very iconic, is a gentleman by the name of Tony Gardner. I'm here in Los Angeles, California at Alterian Studios, a special effects and prop fabrication house. And I'm here with Mr. Tony Gardner, the owner of Alterian Studios. Now, Tony, you've been a, a prop fabricator, makeup specialist. You've been uh, an actor as well, several times. You've been around in this industry for a very long time. Yeah. And you've made some amazing things from uh, working on Michael Jackson's Thriller through Adam's Family, uh, numerous versions of Ch uh, the, the Chucky series. Do you consider yourself a, a prop maker or a puppeteer or? <sighs> I, I sort of consider Alterian to be like a weird art studio and we make whatever we find inspiring. Mm -hmm. When I was reading about your background, um, one of the things that stood out to me because so much that you've, you've done was part of my childhood was you were one of actually two of the zombies in Thriller. <laughs> oh yeah. Well the whole makeup crew, we all worked for uh, Rick Baker mm -hmm. and we all had the opportunity to make zombies on ourselves and, mm -hmm. and be in it. So um, for whatever reason, John Landis liked the way I looked and uh, I get to have an arm fall off and I'm the first one that crawls out of a grave. Um, and then uh, I'm in the theater scene as myself. I'm like two rows behind Michael. And then um, I'm in the dance number. All I had to do is like slap my butt and look over my shoulder. <laughs> so it's like, okay, I can do that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I got a lot of mileage out of that. And I was 18 and that was my first uh, film job. Mm -hmm. Did you set out to get into this line of work or was it sort of just an accident that you ended up in it? How did I, that occur? I just wanted to be involved in filmmaking. I was the weird kid in the neighborhood that made weird movies with their friends. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot more involved back then. You really had to be committed because you're shooting on film and developing and splicing. It's not like what it is today. And then the whole idea of just being involved in filmmaking in some capacity mm -hmm. um, has has just been what I'm really into. It doesn't really matter if they want me to slap my butt and and look in the camera or or build a Omnitrix or a miniature for the Adams family that's 17 feet tall, yeah. actually. Because that was the the house, wasn't it? The Adams yeah, family for the house. sequel. Yeah. yeah, they didn't want to spend the same amount of money on the sequel that they did on the first one, so we built it in miniature. Mm -hmm. But the miniature was 17 feet tall. Miniature. <laughs> and the car, we they had us put the car in the front for scale, and the, their car was about this big. Um, but we had done the house clock in the first film mm -hmm. what, that the film opens on and you never see it again, but all the doors open and all the figures came out and did stuff. Um, and they were like, oh, if those guys can build a house clock, I'm sure they can build a miniature. Uh, a 17 foot tall house. Yeah, yeah, well, I think originally they were thinking they'd probably be around the same size. And then for scale and lighting and fog and all that kind of stuff, they're like, no, let's do it. So many people have no idea that you've been had your hand in so many things that have impacted popular culture, like the Geico Cavemen. That, oh, that was that yeah. was your work as well as yeah. Doft Punk, their helmets. Yeah. How did yeah. that come about? That you, <clears throat> or you, basically were, had a huge hand in the creation of those helmets. Yeah, it was a, it was a collaboration with them, and it was really a lot of fun. Yeah. There was, it was myself, uh, two other sculptors, and then uh, Gimon and and Tamara. <laughs> Um, just like messing around with stuff in the beginning and then uh, the, the guys brought a couple other people from France, their designers, uh, Alex and Martine, had done some sketches and we sort of got started based on that. Um, and it was just sort of like this progressive thing where Spike Jones had suggested me to them because Spike thought I could figure out everything that they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't know how to do LED technology, but 
you know, you bring in the people that, that do. So we brought in the guy from San Francisco that did the Jumbotron screens with the color changing LEDs. And he figured out that part. We just sort of like made it happen. The Geico Cavemen was originally like a one shot deal. Yeah. Three commercials shot over two days. We're like, okay, great. But it was literally like zero budget. <laughs> Like, like zero, like we did generic teeth that had no actors. We rented uh, Nicolas Cage's wigs from Con Air, his wig and his stunt guy's wig yeah. to be the caveman wigs. And because we never had more than two in a shot at the same time. Right. It's like, oh, we can use both the Con Air wigs. I'd like to back up just a bit. The caveman's wigs were Nicolas Cage's wigs. Yeah, for, for the real? first season or, or series of commercials, it's Nicolas Cage's wig from... Uh, I Fun like out. those commercials so much more yeah. now that I know that. <laughs> it's got that history piece. to it. Yeah. That pedigree to that it. That pedigree, yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness. Now, there's, we're standing in one of your, your workshops right now. Yeah, and this, this is basically our warehouse. The width and breadth of stuff that's in here from casting, molding, the body casting, etc. It, has that changed much since you first started doing it? Is, as far I mean, as, materials probably have, but is the process roughly the same now? No, it, like we're doing a lot of stuff, uh, 3D printing now. Mm -hmm. Like Brian Christensen has uh, designed and then printed like the mask for Freaky. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've molded that. I mean, we work in wood, plastic, metal, do silicone molding and, and casting still. But the 3D stuff's really freed us up to, to do a lot of cool stuff. And right. you can design something this big and then shrink it down. To whatever you know, size you to want. To whatever size and make an ornament for your tree out of it or whatever you want to do. Okay, so we're the weird Halloween family on the street and always have been. And uh, we have a Halloween tree there. And it has weird ornaments and it has barbed wire and purple lights and a big owl on the top. Yeah. And my kids grew up thinking everybody had a Halloween tree, but <laughs> we were actually the only one. Um, and as the 3D printing stuff started seeming like a really cool opportunity just to like change sizes of things, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, it'd be great to do like Chucky ornaments for our Halloween tree. And I contacted Trick or Treat Studios and they had just made a deal for licensing to do the dolls, mm -hmm. the, the reproduction dolls. Of, of Chucky. Yeah. yeah, so we sort of made a deal and it's like, I'll help you with the dolls if you help me with, you know, my ornaments. Right. And then now we're doing, we just did this Foo Fighters movie, a uh, spooky movie and did mm -hmm. like the Necronomicon and some prosthetics and a, yep. and a bunch of stuff. Oh, yeah, that's version the, of it sitting right yeah, there. That's yeah, that's the, that's the book version. Yeah. This was, I mean, and that, the book too, the actual real one, um, the cover was designed and, and printed. Well, that was all created in 3D before it was, yeah. before it was done. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And then we, we got the pages and, and just assembled it. So. <laughs> now, is it, now I, at one point when you would do a, a, a casting of someone's head, you would use, you do the life cast method, like yeah. that mold right over there. Right. And I see Dave Grohl's decapitated head. Yeah. How was that, is that process the same or has that changed with 3D technology? <clears throat> uh, good question and good timing on that question. Normally we would do a life cast and then like this one we had to make him look dead. So we'd pour clay into the mold and, and mess with that. We're doing a film right now where we have to do an age makeup on an actress. Mm -hmm. The actress was in New York. So someone in New York did the life cast, mm -hmm. but also did a 3D scan of her. We ended up printing the 3D scan at full size and molding that. And we're using that to design the makeup on instead of using the life cast. We're using the life cast as reference for the 3D scan. Oh, that's fun. So it's, this is like the first time for us there's been this complete. Like almost a swap. It's of, like, yeah, know. we flipped order of priority. Now, do you see that 3D technology taking over completely for the life casting? No, method, I, I just think it's one more great tool. I think like people who are younger, the silicone or alginate or whatever you're using, there's no um, issue as far as the weight pulling their face down. Mm -hmm. But working on older people, there's, there's elastic, definitely yeah. an issue. So being able to do a scan is great. And at the same time, being able to do a scan of an expression, mm -hmm. like a smile or whatever. Like if you're gonna do a, a head that needs to look dead, have him make that expression and scan that. And you're already over halfway to halfway where you wanna be. Yeah. Tony, you've 
have done some amazing stuff, absolutely amazing things. Is there anything that still in your mind sticks out as like, I can't believe I did that? That's like, you uh, think back on it like, yes, that was me. Uh, there's, there's one thing we just did mm -hmm. for this Foo Fighters movie that they gave me the freedom to design a bunch of death scenes. Mm -hmm. And, and I, it's a horror comedy and it's like, that's your opportunity to kind of push the what? buttons right. and push it a little further and sort of toe that line. But you can be so extreme yeah, because it's, it's humorous, yeah. you know? It's supposed to be over the top. Yeah. yeah. So we did something for the Foo Fighters movie, which is called Studio 666, mm -hmm. um, where Rami meets an untimely death and it's just like, I can't believe they let us get away with that is actually my response to that one. I mean, I, I'm grateful for all the opportunities we've had and I'm pleasantly surprised at the longevity right. that, that quite a few of them have had and, and we keep getting to revisit, you know, and, and a lot of times like, like Bad Grandpa. So we started doing Johnny Knoxville as an old man on the Jackass TV series. Right. And, and we just sort of riffed on a disguise makeup. And then um, they started doing the films. Mm -hmm. Jackass 2, we're doing Johnny's makeup and he's like, I think my character's name is Irving Zisman and I'm a, an accountant. And it started turning into this character and then 10 years later, it's Bad Grandpa. Yeah. In between there, we did another Jackass movie where he was old and a bunch of them were old again. Um, and we just did Jackass 4 and, and Irving Zisman is back again and if you had told me when we were doing disguise makeups for the tv series like that it would just recur ago, over and over yeah. yeah and you know we got nominated for an academy award for the makeup yeah uh for that and i mean i like, can see why it's gorgeous a guy named steve proudy was the lead artist on that yeah. and just did a fantastic job how did that come about you working on chucky okay so i had done the animatronic binks cat for hocus pocus and we also did Doug Jones as a zombie. Mm -hmm. But David Kirshner was working on a film and he was, he was very like, like mysterious about it. He's like, could you do like a talking baby and stuff like this? And, and it was like, yeah, I, I don't see why not. Um, and um, they were originally trying to make a deal with uh, Kevin Yeager to come back for Seed of Chucky and, and do Tiffany and Chucky and a, and a child mm -hmm. spawn glenn right glenn um and um they didn't come to a meeting of the minds so three months before everything had to ship they came to me and said can you build three animatronic talking babies but they're not babies they're chucky tiffany and a new one and it's like two of them have to exactly match something that already exists that the fan you know the fan base oh, yeah. is really like oh yeah no, they're, they're vicious yeah and we had three months and we just had to blast it out and put it in boxes and go to Romania. And it was this insane experience. Like, like, like literally it was like seven months of compressed craziness. Mm -hmm. We're like, oh God, that's over. That was nuts. <laughs> and then, you know, a couple of years later, hey, we're going to bring them back. And, and it's been every couple of years since. And, and it's always Don Mancini writing and directing. And it's the same, a lot of the same people. And we really like all of them, so it it's, just works out. Yeah. yeah. Now you talked about Binks the cat from Hocus Pocus, uh -huh. and there's not a whole lot of him left. It's really just his head at this stage, isn't it? Yeah, his head and his his mechanical insides. How much basically. of him was mechanical, and then how was he operated? He um, he was operated by radio control for everything, kind of from from the neck up. Mm -hmm. There were different versions of mechanical Binks, same way there's different versions of the mechanical Chucky. Right. But like for Binks, there was one that was a hand puppet that had mechanical uh, front on that. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one that was a complete standalone metal armature and the legs were posable, the back legs were posable, but the front legs could articulate and talk, mm -hmm. which in our film test, they're like, it's way too creepy having a cat <laughs> move his hands while he's right. talking. <laughs> so let's back it up back closer to a real cat mm -hmm. um, and all the facial features were radios like you know joysticks for toy car yeah. kind of mindset so Binks fully functional was probably like I, I want to it's been a while I want to say like five or six um, 
uh, puppeteers. Mm -hmm. When we do Chucky, there's, to do his whole body, there's like seven of us. Right. If we wanted to do fingers, uh, we need another person. Right. And then, then there's eight of us, you know? And then digital technology was just coming in and they were like, oh, we can put a digital face on it. We don't need to. All the puppeteering. And yeah, stuff, yeah, so they scaled back us on that and then Billy ended up getting busier. Yeah. What's fun is we just did the sequel mm -hmm. and we did Billy again on Doug. Yeah. And I got to do book this time, which I, I guess if you're asking, is there something you've done that you really yeah. enjoy the book for having Hocus done? Pocus, yeah. It's like, I wish I could have worked on the first one, mm -hmm. but I, I didn't have that opportunity. So it was cool to get to do it on this one. That's and it, the book has more personality and a little more character. Right. So that keeps it fun. So if you wouldn't mind, um, there has been this long standing argument on the internet that Binks mm -hmm. is the same animatronic cat from Sabrina the Teenage Witch. No. No, that, that is, is not, not true. true. No, right. not at all. I knew it was, was not true. I was but... asked to go on set with Sabrina yeah. after Hocus Pocus had come out to look at their cat mm -hmm. and just give advice on, on my experience. Mm -hmm. But it, it already existed and they were yeah. already filming with it. Yeah. You know, so we talked about it with the people and it was all there and yeah. great, yeah. you know? See you later kind of thing. And there you have it. That is the gospel. They yes. are not the same cat. The Daft Punk Technologic music mm -hmm. video. Yeah. We built this little robot DJ and it's cobbled together from like Tiffany's teeth and Chucky's under skull. I think it has Glenn's arms. It was like, what do we have in spare parts that we can put this little guy together with? Yeah. And everybody is so obsessed that it's exactly like we took Chucky's skin off and used yeah. Chucky. And it's like, there, there is a lot of him in there. Yeah. But if you look at like the eyes glow red and, and yeah. the teeth are way too small and it's, it doesn't line up. Now, I'm from what could be called a, a flyover state, Indiana. And I spent many, many years basically believing that I could never work in this industry. And now oh. in some small way I do. Yeah. And for a lot of folks, they still feel that way because everybody believes like only you have to be in California or right. Georgia. Do you have any advice for people that want to do what you do for a living about I, I, how to get into it? I think what's nice now is you can you can be anywhere and mm -hmm. do content from your bedroom or wherever. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter where you are. I grew up in Ohio. I was a kid in Ohio that went to Ohio University. Okay, in Athens. For, for a year as a yeah. theater major and went, I want to do movies and there's nothing in Ohio. Yeah. Um, and I had already run the gamut of weird ideas with all my friends there. And it's like, well, I'll go out to California and get some more experience. So I applied to a couple of schools and got in <laughs> and, and then dropped out yeah. after a year. And because I had a, a job opportunity and yeah. I was like, I can always go back to school, but this opportunity is only going to exist for the next three months. Mm -hmm. This thriller actually. Right. Was that, yeah. was, cause that was your, your very first gig was, was yeah. thriller. Yeah. yeah. Tony, thank you so much for having me here. Oh, I yeah. really do appreciate it. If, if anybody wanted to find out more about Alterian Studios, where would they go? Uh, you can go to our website, uh, www.alterianinc.com. Mm -hmm. And then we're also posting on Instagram and Twitter, Twitter as I think Alterian Inc. Mm -hmm. in both instances. Well, thank you again, Tony. I really do appreciate oh, your time. Oh, anytime. Yeah. As an example of the apple not falling far from the tree, I am here with Miss Kira Gardner, the daughter of Tony Gardner, and you yourself also work in the film industry, correct? Yes. I grew up seeing really like the makeup side of things, mm -hmm. like growing up uh, coming to set with my dad would be in the makeup trailer mm -hmm. and having that experience. So I really only knew like one aspect to filmmaking. I didn't really know what a director did or like have much interaction with directors or maybe I did but I was too little and right. I didn't I don't know yeah. I'm like four everybody's <laughs> giant um, and so I didn't really think of that as a possibility and then as the years went on you know I thought I wanted to be a nurse because I was desensitized to blood and guts yeah and all those lovely things um, but I did whatever do you mean what <laughs> yeah I don't know why and um, then I volunteered at a local hospital for a while. It was just too boring for somebody who has ADHD. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I really needed to be on my feet more and not have the same routine. And so my parents were really awesome and I was really privileged for them to be able to afford it. They um, encouraged me to take a film class at USC for a summer. 
So I took a film class and I directed my first short because they made you learn everything right. that summer and I fell in love with it because my experience growing up was in the trailer and those moments on set are so fun because you're with the actor while they have their guard down, while they have like an hour or four hours of makeup. Yeah. And so you get to know them as people and that's the same thing as directing. You get to work with the actors and right. get to know them as people and then go through all these different things with them. So that's kind of how I fell in love with that. I guess my first paid gig is actually being in a Daft Punk music video. So I started out acting. I was seven and my sister was, I think, 11. And we were in the prime time of your life music video. Right. Because my dad, um, you know, usually is in projects that involve heavy SFX and he needed kids who could withstand heavy SFX. And you'd grown up with it. Right. My first yeah. face cast was done in preschool for show and tell. So I had <laughs> been used to this yeah. for a very long time. So my dad used my sister to do the whole skin peeling thing that's in the, at the end of the music video. And then I played her flashback because we looked just alike, right. especially when we were younger. But yeah, it wasn't until working on the Foo Fighters movie. It was my first gig that I booked uh, after film school okay. and so they came to my dad Dave and my dad knew each other from doing the run music video my dad did all the old age makeup on the guys okay. and um, they basically made the script around all these kills that my dad had wanted to do but never had the opportunity to and then I was already I've worked for my dad since I was maybe 15 mm -hmm. um, doing like behind the scenes videography or photography and then since I went to film school editing clips together for him to post on social media so I was already filming the BTS of my dad and everything he was having to build like so far in advance because he's, <laughs> of the complexities of all these kills the producer is really really awesome John Ramsey and Jim Rota and they um, filmed a lot of the Foo Fighters documentaries like Sonic Highway and all that stuff but they were producing this movie so they didn't have time to be filming the making of it right. and so they saw me with the camera and I had <laughs> directed a short documentary on growing up with the Child's Play franchise that was really successful mm -hmm. um, not to toot my own horn but like NBC Universal bought it. No go it. ahead this is the camera do it. <laughs> I made a movie once <laughs> and uh, so they knew I had documentary filmmaking experience right. and they knew I was making a longer version of it so they trusted this kid who had just come out of film school to film all the entirety of their making of. So that's how I came to film all of the BTS, which I've filmed for two years now until yesterday was my final day of filming of the premiere. Like, as of filming yesterday, properly yesterday, you finally finished it. Yeah, oh, after wow. two years of filming with them. Intermittently, wow. of course. So what do you have to look forward to in the future? Do you have stuff? I know some stuff can't be talked about, mm -hmm. but what are you looking forward to projects in the future? Or what do you want to pursue now that you have Quite frankly, a solid start. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm would, very lucky. What, do, what would you want to move on to? Would you want to pursue like what your father's done or go more towards directing and editing? My goal is to direct films, mostly horror would be the goal, and with stuff that my dad does because yeah. so many people who don't have experience shooting mm -hmm. heavy practical effects films, there's so much more like ways to do it more efficiently mm -hmm. where their work gets to really shine and then you get, get to shine, shine more. Yeah. But because people don't know, it's not like you press a button and Chucky works right. automatically. Like There's a huge team down. involved in the making Chucky work. You know? Yeah. And knowing how that works together with the camera makes that function beautifully. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so important. <laughs> so that's like my goal is to be able to direct stuff like that with that knowledge. Mm -hmm. But my mindset is never like realistic characters like it's either a four foot animatronic fish puppet or there's a monster or it's a werewolf yeah. it's never really grounded truly in reality and I can't not write that because that's what I've literally grown up with as right. being my reality so I literally don't know anything else and that you're able to pursue it as a career is fantastic now you are compared to me quite a young person and you are and you've you, you, and you yourself said so you're privileged to be able to have a lot of inroads into this yeah how would you suggest to those who want to pursue this to go about pursuing it? Well, I'm super glad I went to film school mm -hmm. only because I, the films that I made in film school is what ended up getting me this job with the Foo Fighters. Right. Um, but you don't need film school right. today. You really don't. You don't need a gr degree. Don't put yourself in debt if you don't need to. You know, I was privileged enough to be able to have parents who could help me mm -hmm. and afford it and, um, a dad already in the industry, which I don't take for granted, but 
knowing what's going on today, like 3D printing is so huge. You mm -hmm. can do that from home or at least buy a Maya software package or mm -hmm. Blender and start working from home. Um, really just like you can get on a set as a PA and it's all about connections. It, it yeah. really, I think a lot of people worry that they're gonna move somewhere and not know anybody. And it's like, as soon as you can get onto one set and start meeting people, they're gonna hire the person that's nicer over the person that's an asshole right. and really talented 10 times over. And my dad says that all the time. Like, yeah. uh, niceness goes very far. Although some people take niceness for weakness, especially yeah. if you are a woman or woman of color specifically. Um, but really that, you, you don't need to be in LA, Atlanta, or New York. You can start doing things from home. Social media has gotten so crazy, as we know. As we know, because that's how we met. Yes, yeah. through TikTok. Yeah. And it's so crazy how like a simple video can get <laughs> millions of views. Yeah. You can get your content out there. The film industry has never been more accessible today. So I would just say, if you have an idea, go for it. If you want to direct, write, write your own projects mm -hmm. so that it's not in the hands of other people and you have the control and then find friends who will do it with you. Yeah. Social media can get so many doors opened and make the connections that are necessary for this. I'm here because of those connections. Yeah. Connections with Kira, connections with, uh, I don't know if I can say his name, but the prop master that first hired me to work. It was social media that made that happen, so absolutely. And part of this video series, the whole part of the whole point of this is to inspire people that they can pursue this industry yeah. no matter where they live, whether it's in a flyover state like me or even in California. Yeah. Make those connections no matter how you, you can do it, and they're everywhere. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and even if you feel like you wanna reach out to somebody on Instagram and you think, oh, they'll never see this, do chances it. are they do. <laughs> My dad responds to a bunch of people. I, I respond to a bunch of people who DM me, I, not people asking me for a freaking Chucky doll, but uh, <laughs> everybody else who has questions about advice, for sure. Yeah, I'll put all of her social media links <laughs> down in, in, in the show notes for this so that everybody can find them. Yay. But once again, Kira, thank you so much for your time. Thank I you. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you all for joining me. This has been Prop History. <laughs>